quick guide to the management of keratoconus. Part 15. Start of 2. In the previous video, part 14, I talked about suspicion, tomography, refraction, and identification of the 12 parameters. In this video, I will start talking about the most important step, it is logic thinking. Logic thinking consists of answering three questions. To do or not to do? What is next? And is it the least aggressive? Actually, the most important question among these questions is, what is next? But before we start the logic thinking step, let us review the available options for treatment of ectatic corneal diseases. Glasses, contact lenses, corneal crosslinking, corneal crosslinking with customized laser treatment, intracorneal rings, myo ring with and without corneal crosslinking, fake KUL implantation, and keratoplasty. Now we can divide these options into three categories. Aiding measures, corneal remodeling, and corneal transplant. There are two types of corneal transplant, lamellar keratoplasty and penetrating keratoplasty. Corneal remodeling consists of two types, laser treatment and intracorneal rings including my ring. And the aiding measures are contact lens, glasses, and fake KUL implantation. Now, in order to find the proper path to which is the proper treatment, we have to start from the vision of the patient. We can divide vision into good or poor. Now, good vision can be defined as corrected distance visual acuity better than 0.6 decimal. The difference between the corrected and uncorrected distance visual acuity is more than two lines and there is insignificant high order aberration symptoms. Contrary to that, we can say that vision is poor whenever there is corrected distance visual acuity 0.6 or less in addition, there is a difference between corrected and uncorrected distance visual acuity of two lines or less, and there is significant high order symptoms. Now, whenever vision is good, we can go to aiding measures, so we can advise the patient to go for contact lenses or glasses or even for fake KUL implantation. But in some times, when the cornea is irregular, we can improve irregularity by corneal remodeling measures, laser or intracorneal rings, including my ring, and then we can follow this by the aiding measures. And when the vision is poor, we have to know whether the potential visual acuity is good or not. If the potential visual acuity is good, we have to go to corneal remodeling in order to improve corneal irregularities by laser or intracorneal rings. After that, we can go to aiding measures. Or, in some cases, we can go immediately to contact lenses, just contact lenses from the aiding measures. But if the potential visual acuity is poor as well, then we have to go for corneal transplant, which includes lamellar keratoplasty and penetrating keratoplasty, and this can be followed later by corneal remodeling, followed by aiding measures, or depending on the irregularity of the corneal transplant, we can go directly to the aiding measures. So, if we put in mind this flowchart, we can know which is the best option depending on vision. After this, we can start answering the questions. In this video, I'm going to answer the first question, to do or not to do. 
Now, we can use glasses whenever we have good visual acuity and reasonable difference between corrected and uncorrected visual acuity. In addition, the high order aberrations are insignificant and the spherical equiv equivalent is less than six diopters. Now, regarding this point, if the spherical equivalent is above six diopters, now, in spite of good vision, in some cases, the high refractive errors, the spectacles correcting the, these high refractive errors, by themselves have their own aberrations. So, it is not reasonable to use glasses whenever the spherical equivalent is above six diopters. And it's very important to avoid glasses whenever there is significant an isometropia and an isoconia. Contact lenses, of course, can be used when the patient is tolerant to them and when the potential visual acuity is good and there is a reasonable difference between the potential visual acuity and uncorrected distance visual acuity. Corneal crosslinking, in general, is used in cases of progressive ectatic corneal diseases and when there is an indication to do customized laser treatment and in cases with keratoconus suspect with positive scissoring reflex or keratoconus suspect with positive family history and borderline thickness and finally when there is form frost keratoconus with positive scissoring reflex or borderline thickness. Now starting with the first indication which is progression. There are three situations in which we have to consider the case as progressive. The first situation is age. Whenever the patient is younger than 25 years or in some, years, some regions younger than 30 years, he should be considered as having a progressive disease and there is no need to document progression. Otherwise, we have to document progression and this is the second situation. Now, progression is defined as an increase in K-max by more than two diopters and at the same time thinning at the thinnest location more than 15 microns over the period of observation, for example, three or six months. And we have to have both criteria in order to say that there is progression. So there must be a change in K-max and thinning. The third situation is pellucid marginal degeneration. Pellucid marginal degeneration is considered as a progressive disease regardless of age. The second indication is when we want to do customized laser treatment. Now, let us discuss customized laser treatment in combination with corneal crosslinking. Actually, there are three types PTK, topography guided PRK, and corneal wavefront guided PRK. Before we start discussing these three modalities, we have to know that they are not refractive procedures. It means that we are not doing them to correct the refractive error that accompanies the ectatic corneal disease. So we are not aiming at bringing the patient to 6 over 6 with perfect vision because they are not refractive procedures. They aim at reducing corneal irregularities because they are remodeling measures and therefore they will improve the quality of vision. And improving quality of vision does not mean improving the uncorrected visual acuity because sometimes the uncorrect visual acuity will become worse. Meanwhile, the corrected visual acuity becomes much better with less refraction. 
So we have to put this in mind when we indicate one of the following procedures. Now starting with cross-linking with PTK. And this is called the Cretan protocol. Now Cretan protocol is the application of PTK in order to remove 50 microns of the superficial cornea, including the epithelium, in order to create a regular surface, and then we apply corneal cross-linking. So we take off 50 microns by PTK over a zone of 6.5 to 7 millimeters, and the final residual stromal bed should be more than 400 microns in order to be able to apply corneal crosslinking safely. Now, what is the technique? We apply PTK for epithelial removal, diameter 6.5 to 7 millimeters, PTK ablation depth is 50 microns, followed by mechanical removal of the epithelium of 1 millimeter at the boundaries. So we will obtain a total area without epithelium of about 8 to 9 millimeter diameter. After that, we apply Dresden protocol. So as you see, Cretan protocol is just an alternative to mechanical removal of the epithelium before application of corneal crosslinking. So it is not a refractive procedure. It is just an alternative to remove the epithelium by PTK rather than mechanical in order to obtain a regular surface. Actually, these are the best situations to obtain results rather than indications of Cretan protocol because Cretan protocol has, not, has no indication. Let us say it is just an alternative to mechanical removal but it gives its best results when the topographical astigmatism is less than 2.5 diopters, but it can be used when the topographical astigmatism equals to or higher than 2.5 diopters when Athens protocol cannot be done. However, in all cases, the pre-op thinnest corneal thickness should start from 450 in order to be able to apply corneal crosslinking at the end of the procedure. Now, the expected results of this Cretan protocol, according to the studies, reduction of steep K by 3.5 diopters and reduction of astigmatism, topographical astigmatism, by 1.75 diopters. Corneal crosslinking with topography guided PRK or Athens protocol. Now, the principle of this protocol is to regularize the cornea by flattening the steep areas and steepening the flat areas. However, we do this by topography guided PRK to ablate up to 50 microns and the residual stromal bed should be at least 400 microns to be able to apply corneal crosslinking at the end of the procedure. So the technique consists of removal of 50 microns of epithelium by PTK. This is the new Athens protocol. The previous one, the old Athens protocol, was mechanical removal of the epithelium. Now the new technique is PTK removal of 50 microns of the epithelium, correction up to 70% of astigmatism by an ablation depth no more than 50 microns, and the residual bed should be at least 400 microns at the end of the procedure in order to be able to apply crosslinking safely. Then we apply accelerated corneal crosslinking protocol. In the old Athens protocol, it was Dresden crosslinking protocol, but in the new Athens protocol, it is the accelerated corneal crosslinking protocol. Indications Athens protocol is indicated in major geographical irregularities. They are decentered optical zone, small optical zone, flat and steep central islands, post RK and post keratoplasty, keratoconus and post LASIK 
ectasia. Now, since we are talking here about keratoconus and post lasik ectasia, we have to know that. We have to leave at the end of the procedure at least 400 microns of stroma. We can ablate 10 to 15 microns in order to treat 70% of the astigmatism. And if we add the 50 microns of PTK to remove the epithelium, so as you see, we have to have at least a pre op corneal thickness between 460 to 500 or above in order to be able to apply Athens protocol. In addition, since it is applied on major corneal irregularities, usually topographical astigmatism is more than or equals to 2.5 diopters. So, for example, if the pre-op corneal thickness, thinnest corneal thickness, is 460 microns, we can ablate only 10 microns. If the pre-op is 490, we can apply or we can ablate 40 microns. Now, corneal crosslinking with wavefront guided PRK. Now, the principle of this treatment is to measure the high order aberrations, corneal high order aberrations, and then to select those aberrations that are more than 0.5 diopters. We have to, to put in mind that we have to measure the high order aberrations by RMS root mean square using diopters rather than microns. So, as you see here, I have to treat trefoil, coma, and spherical aberration. After that, I input the data into the eczema machine, and then I select only these three high order aberrations to be treated. So the technique is to determine the high order aberrations to be treated, and we have to aim at correcting up to 70% of astigmatism. Then we start by PTK removal of the epithelium of 50 microns, and the residual stromal bed should be at least 400 microns at the end of the procedure before corneal crosslinking application. Now, corneal crosslinking can be applied either by Dresden protocol or the accelerated protocol. What are the indications of wave front guided treatment? And what are the indications that make us use wave front rather than topography guided treatment? Mild irregularities like virgin eyes with high order aberrations, very early keratoconus, mild cases of post RK, and mild cases of post keratoplasty. And it can be used as an alternative to topography guided treatment in some cases. Now, in very early keratoconus, the topography guided, the topographical astigmatism is usually less than 2.5 diopters, and we have to put in mind that the pre op thinnest cornea thickness should be at least 450 microns. Now, if it is as an alternative to topography guided treatment, then we can accept topography uh, astigmatism more than 2.5 diopters, but still the pre op corneal thickness should be at least 450 microns. From where these numbers came? If we want to leave at least 400 microns of residual stromal bed to be able to apply coronal crosslinking at the end of the procedure, and if we want to ablate between central as central between 0 to 50 microns central ablation depth, and if we put the 50 microns of epithelium that will be removed by the PTK, then at least we should have pre-op 
450 to 500 microns. Now, if we compare this with the topography guided treatment, we find here that we started with 450 N wavefront guided treatment, while in topography guided treatment, we started with 460. Now, actually, in wavefront guided treatment, we can control the central ablation depth and compensate by making it zero. While in topography guided treatment, we cannot compensate and we cannot control the central ablation depth to be zero. At least it should be 10 microns. So they are technical things, but we have to put in mind that at least 450 for wavefront guided treatment and 460 for the topography guided treatment. Now, as we said, that wavefront guided treatment is indicated whenever we have mild irregularities. Now, what is the difference between mild irregularities and moderate to high irregularities, which are indication for topography guided treatment? We can differentiate between mild irregularities, which are indication for wavefront guided, and moderate to high, which are indication for topography guided treatment, starting with the complaint of the patient. Now, the patient usually complains of shadows, ghost images, starbursts, and halos, and mild irregularities. And in moderate to high irregularities, these symptoms are more severe and with decreased vision. Usually, the corrected distance visual acuity in mild regularities is good, better than 0 0.6. But in moderate to high irregularities, it is usually bad or fair. The amount of topographical astigmatism is usually less than 2.5 diopters in mild cases, while it is 2.5 or higher in moderate to high cases. Now, the manifest astigmatism is measurable and consistent with the topographical astigmatism in mild cases, while it may be measurable in moderate to high cases but inconsistent with the topographical astigmatism. Finally, we can measure wavefront and the measurement is valid within 6 mm in mild cases, while in moderate to high cases, if wavefront is measurable, it is not valid. So, as you see, we have three options of custom laser treatment, but these are not refractive procedures. This is why we saw that there was no inclusion of sphere in the considerations. We don't treat sphere by these options. We just treat astigmatism. Now to know which option is the best among these three options, we start with the thinnest corneal thickness. If it is 450 to 460, we look at the spherical equivalent. If it is minus 1.5 or more, we do cretan protocol. If it is less than minus 1.5 diopters, we do wavefront guided treatment. And if the thickness is 460 or better, we look at the topographical astigmatism. If it is 2.5 diopters or higher, we do topographical, topography guided treatment. Otherwise, we look at the spherical equivalent in order to do either cretan or wavefront guided treatment. I'll give you some examples. Pre-op thinnest corneal thickness is 453 microns with manifest refraction minus 2, minus 2 at 180. In this case, the spherical equivalent is more than minus 1.5 diopters, so the indication is return protocol. The same corneal thickness, 453, 
and the manifest refraction is zero with minus two at 180 so the spherical equivalent is less than minus 1.5 so the indication is wavefront guided treatment now corneal thickness is better than 460 as you see here it is 470 we look at the topographical astigmatism it is minus 3.5 at 180 so we do topography guided treatment now the same pre-op thinnest corneal thickness 470 the topographical astigmatism is less than 2.5 diopters so we look at the manifest refraction as you see here it is minus 3 with minus 1.5 at 180 so the spherical equivalent is more than minus 1.5 so we do cretan protocol Another example, the pre-op thinnest corneal thickness is 470, the topographical astigmatism minus 1.5, and the manifest refraction is less than minus 1.5, so we do wavefront guided treatment. So back to indications of corneal cross-linking in general. We talked about progression, we talked about customized laser treatment, and now about corneal uh, keratoconus suspect with positive scissoring reflex and keratoconus suspect with positive family history and borderline thickness as in this flow chart as you remember in the previous video we said keratoconus suspect we look at scissoring reflex if it is positive we do corneal cross-linking if it is not positive we ask about from the family history if it is positive, we look at the thickness. If the thickness is critical, we don't wait. We have to act. So we do corneal cross-linking. Otherwise, we observe. Now regarding foam frost keratoconus, as you remember in this flow chart, whenever we have foam frost keratoconus, we look at the scissoring reflex. If it is positive, we do cross-linking. If it is not Positive, if it is negative, there is no need to ask about the family history. Why? Because in form frost keratoconus, the other eye is ectetic corneal disease. So we look at corneal thickness in the eye of the form frost keratoconus. If the thickness is critical, then we have to do corneal cross thinking. Now, in corneal cross thinking, in general, K-max should be less than 60 diopters, and there should be no central and paracentral scars. In addition, the corrected distance visual acuity or the potential visual acuity should be better than 0 0.6. Now, we don't do cross-linking in general when K-max is more than 60 diopters, when there are central and paracentral scars, when vision can be rehabilitated first by intracorneal rings, and when the thickness is not fit for customized laser vision correction. Now, Dresden protocol is the epi of protocol. We don't do Dresden protocol when corneal thickness without the epithelium is less than 400 microns, and we don't do the hypotonic protocol, it is as well an epi of technique, but with using the hypotonic cross-linking um, in a special protocol, we don't do it whenever the pre-op corneal thickness without epithelium is less than 370 microns, and we don't use it for customized laser vision correction. Now we don't do epion protocols when the corneal thickness, the pre-op corneal thickness with epithelium is less than 400 microns. And we don't use this type of treatment for customized laser vision correction. And usually we don't go for epion techniques whenever the epi-off are or can be done. Now we don't do customized laser vision correction with corneal cross-linking when Corneal thickness is not fit, 
and when the potential visual acuity is not good, and when there is no reasonable difference between potential visual acuity and incorrect visual acuity, and when there are any corneal scar or voct striae. We don't do intracorneal rings whenever there is any corneal scar or voct striae, when the thinnest corneal thickness is less than 400 microns, when the K-max is above 60 diopters, when the potential visual acuity is less than 0.6, and we don't do intracorneal ring implantation in corneal grafts. We don't do my ring when there is any corneal scar, when the thinnest corneal thickness with epithelium is less than 380 microns, when the potential visual acuity is 0.6 or less, and when there is no reasonable difference between potential visual acuity and incorrect visual acuity, and of course, we cannot implant my ring within corneal grafts. We don't do fake KULs whenever there is any corneal scar or voct striae, when the corrected visual acuity, not the potential, the corrected visual acuity is 0.6 or less, when there is no reasonable difference between corrected and uncorrected visual acuity, and whenever the conditions or the prerequisite for implantation are not available, including anterior chamber depth, anterior chamber angle, anterior chamber volume, endothelial cell count, and when the refractive error is not reasonable enough to give us a reason to put fake KUL inside the eye. And finally, we don't do keratoplasty whenever other options are applicable. By this, we finished answering the first question, to do or not to do. In the coming video, which is the last video, video number 16, I will answer the two questions, what is next and is it the least aggressive? Thank you very much.